So, so what's the plan for today? Are we, are we, uh, what are we doing? The vision in my head is that you had come up with some, like, hard hitting legal questions, and then we find out how much I know, and then also just kind of let the conversation flow off that, because there is some funky shit that happens with the law, so. Well, I have done a little research. And by that, I mean about 15 minutes. So I'm very prepared. Perfect. This is the Experience Podcast with me and someone else. And lawman. Yeah, he, a future a future lawman. That's uh, true. Nathaniel is, is back. Um, he's ready to, uh, I guess, test his knowledge. So um, I wasn't sure how, like, what kind of questions you want. I, I just Googled, like, bar exam sample questions. Oh, no. <laughs> which I was hoping... might be a bad idea because <laughs> I'm not sure how much you're going to know after just a year. Oh, no, but also, let's be clear. Law school does not prepare anybody for the bar. And that too, I was going to say, you're really more, yeah, it's kind of, this is, this might be, but it's like, it's multiple choice, you know, like I I have like the essay ones, but I don't know. No, I was, those are like super long. I was, I was hoping for something like, like, um, you know, I can't actually think of a good example off the top of my head. That's why I wanted you to make it. Yeah. Like like, if, if I cut my tree or like if my neighbor cuts their tree and it like, you know, like knocks into my tree and then like the fence breaks, like whose fault is it or something stupid. Well, like that. I think, you know, what I, I mean? think these, um, these, some of these bar questions are kind of on the along those lines. So I think you could okay. probably reason your way through them. Um, also, wait, you know, state are we in as if I know anything? Uh, I don't know. I don't literally know one thing that's different. This about is states. the multi-state bar exam. So I think oh, it's okay. pretty generic. Great. Yeah. I, so I did find some other Con ones. Like I found, I found in New York, like essay one, but I feel like that's too much. Like I didn't want to. So I was, I was like trying to find good questions, and some of these, like these essay questions, the question itself is multiple pages. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. I don't, because they give. Fact I don't feel like. Yeah, because I don't think we need to read all that. I didn't want to read all that on the show. So no, yeah. Uh, if we get to it, and then I have some other stuff here, like some marriage. This, this looks like a marriage question. Oh, okay, nice. I don't know. I don't know how much. Um, anyway, uh, so yeah, again, I, I I wasn't sure what type of law questions you wanted, so I just kind of this is going to be so disappointing because I'm going to know it, nothing. Well, <laughs> that's kind of it's, it's, learn. Well, yeah, well, we'll see what happens. I mean, I, I don't. What am I? What am I supposed to look up? Basic law questions for dummies? Like, no, I don't know. I just. Uh... Because I don't know, know anything about law, so I wouldn't even know what to look up. You know, we no, were kind but of see, like, I, the the point was because you don't know anything about law, I was hoping you would have some stuff where it's like, oh, like, I don't know this thing about law. How interesting would that be to know? And then to be like, well, what do you know? We talked about that in my property class or something like that. All right. So I found I found some other like a little more basic questions that we can also go through. So if you struggle in the the multiple choice. <laughs> Uh, okay. Bar questions. We can go to the, these basic. Okay. Uh, like what is what is like like for example one of them that's like super easy is like what does the O in E E O stand for? So, yeah. um, stuff like that. Okay. So question number one. Um, do I want to start with this one? Uh, no. I, let me make sure the answers are at the bottom here. Okay, they are. <laughs> At first, I was like, I'm going to find something without the answer. So I wanted to know. All right. So you might this. I mean, this looks on the surface, just like looking at it at a glance. I think you could get a lot of these. OK. A father lived with his son, who was an alcoholic. When the drunk, son alcoholic? The son off, the father lived with, with, with his son, who was an alcoholic. So that okay. implies the son is an alcoholic. When drunk, yeah. the son often became violent and physically abused his father. As a result, the father always lived in fear. One night, the mm-hmm. father heard his son on the front stoop making loud, obscene remarks. The father was yep. certain that his son was drunk and was terrified that he would be physically beaten again. Yep. In his fear, he bolted the front door 
and took out a revolver. When the son discovered that the door was bolted, he kicked it down. As the son burst through the front door, his father shot him four times in the chest, killing him. The yep. son was not under the influence of alcohol or any drug and did not intend to harm his father. At trial, the father presented the above facts and asked the judge to instruct the jury on self-defense. So the question is, how should the judge instruct the jury with respect to self-defense? And I have, you know, it's, it's multiple, it's multiple guesses. Oh, okay, wait, wait. Before you give the, before you give those, I want to just lay out some initial thoughts. So, so wait, this is actually perfect because this is a crazy thing that we learned. So a big see, thing. See, see, okay, look, give me credit here. I found a good question. No, yeah, you're doing great. This is, this is excellent. So a big thing that's just absolutely bonkers that we learned in crim, criminal law, is that there's a thing called the imminence requirement. Yeah, we call it crim. There's a thing called the imminence requirement, which is basically that you are not allowed to propose self-defense unless the danger is imminent. But the thing is, imminent is a pretty tight term. So the thing is, like, in this situation, right, the, the history of continued abuse from the son actually does not matter at all like the the judge is not allowed to factor that in when instructing the jury now this is let's be clear super controversial because i mean how ridiculous is that like you know if something happens a hundred times and the same pattern unfolds you should be reasonably certain that's going to happen again but technically like the the danger uh, to your life or bodily harm needs to be imminent as like it is happening when you do the self-defense. So if it's literally like the dad is like standing like 10 feet away from the door and the second it gets bolted de- or knocked down by the son, he starts shooting him. I don't believe that the judge is allowed to instruct the jury for self-defense because the, the danger from the son was not imminent in general. Now, here's something that I'm not totally sure that might come up. There's also something called the castle rule, which is basically you are not expected to have to, like, run away from danger if it's in your house. You're allowed to, like, protect yourself in your house. You don't have to leave it to get away. So what might complicate that a little is that the house is, like, the father and the sons. Presumably that's both of their domiciles. So I don't know exactly how that plays in, but I'm pretty sure all that's going to matter is that the dad lives there, which means he's allowed to protect himself in the house. So I'm not a thousand percent sure at this moment, but I do know that like the history of abuse is not going to be allowed to factor into this. Yeah. So the, so the multiple, the, the, the options here are, are pretty like they're what you would expect them to be, right? It's like, Give the self-defense okay. instruction because it so so A is give the self-defense instruction because it expresses the defense's theory of the case. B is give the self-defense instruction because the evidence is sufficient to raise the defense. C is deny the self-defense instruction because the father was not in imminent danger from his son. And D is deny the self-defense instruction because the father used excessive force. Mm. Okay. Uh just because of everything I led with, I'm going to go with C. So this answer key says the, the correct answer is B, which is for those. Give, who, really? give the self-defense okay. instruction because the evidence is sufficient to raise the defense. Okay, I guess that must be the castle rule thing because um, the son did, like, break into the house. Yeah, so he – so – so uh when the son discovered that the door was bolted, he kicked it down and burst through the front door. Yeah, I, okay. I guess technically that's enough. That's a good question, though. The father heard his son it's a making loud, thing. obscene remarks. In that cell. Yeah, you got the loud, obscene remarks. You got the bursting through the door. The problem is the yes. loud, obscene remarks still don't necessarily mean it's imminent. Yeah, okay, so. maybe. I, I mean, I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just trying to... <laughs> I have no idea. Okay, okay so the next one is like a railroad crossing situation. Oh, All right, great. So the second question. A man sued a railroad for personal injury suffered when his car was struck by a train at an unguarded crossing. Yeah. The major issue is whether the train sounded its whistle before arriving at the crossing. The railroad has offered the testimony of a resident who has lived near the crossing for 15 years. 
Although she was not present on the occasion, present on the occasion in question, she will testify that whether, whenever she is home, the train always sounds its whistle before arriving at the crossing. Is the resident's testimony admissible? Uh, so again, she, she's not there. She's not there at the scene, at this scene, but she's, she's lived there for 15 years. She's always heard the, the, uh, the, the whistle. Yeah, yeah. Okay, this is too bad because I'm going to talk about something that has, <laughs> that is not exactly where the question went, but there's a very famous tort case where this guy was like walking on a path next to a railroad track and one of like the doors of, <laughs> one of the train cars was like open for no reason. And, you know, the train is just like bolting ahead and the the guy has no, and it's dark. So the guy can't see, but he has no reason to think that any of the train cars are going to be open and it like knocks him in the head and he might've died or no, no, he got severely injured, but the court held that like, look, when you walk on a path next to a train track, you need to know that there's a chance that like something bad's going to happen. And since you put yourself in that situation, you need to be aware. So I was hoping that when you started the question, it was going to be something like that. But uh, to the actual question, I don't think, ah, okay. So like, what are we balancing here? If there's like so a sincere need, pattern. Of, well, let me read the, the like, options then. Maybe that'll help. Well, right, well, okay. well, well, wait, wait, wait. I, let, let me let me just talk about the two things that are balancing. First. Okay. So like a clear pattern could show that it was like more likely to happen, but at the end of the day, it doesn't speak to like the actual facts. So the question is like, is the testimony gonna like prejudice the jury more than it provides like substantive evidence of what occurred? And well, my does that matter guess, though? Like you're not. You're not judging whether it's good evidence. You're whether judging whether it's admissible, right? Or do those well, mean oh, the same yes, thing? Yes, like, kind of, because like th there is a rule with admissibility where like uh like it 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 needs to if it's gonna like bias the jury, that has to be outweighed by the actual yeah like substantive fact finding that it gives to the jury. Okay. So, well, let me read, let sure. me read the Let's options. See. So A. So so the question is: Is the resident's testimony admissible? Again, we got the railroad crossing. This mm -hmm. this resident has lived there for 15 years. She's going to say, "Yeah, I always hear the whistle, but this guy is trying to sue for not hearing the whistle." Just as a recap. So is the resident's testimony admissible? A. No, due to the resident's lack of personal knowledge regarding the incident in question. B. No, because habit evidence is limited to the conduct of persons, not businesses. C, yes, as evidence of a routine practice, or D, yes, as a summary of her present sense impressions. Okay. I think I have it down to a 50-50, but I don't even want to say in case it's not one of those two. <laughs> Um, what was A again? No. A for, yeah, A is, uh, where am I? Yeah, A is no due to the resident's lack of personal knowledge regarding the incident in question. All right, I'm actually going to go with C. C is yes as evidence of a routine practice. Oh, that sounds Daniel, bad, you, you got your You got your first one right. It was A? It was C. Yes. Oh, it was C. Yes. Practice. Let's go. Okay. That's kind of, I mean, I guess maybe 15 years is enough because of the balance I was saying before. If it was like one year, yeah, maybe yeah. they'd be like, I don't know if that's sufficient, but perhaps a 15 year pattern is enough to say like, see, there's pretty good odds that it actually happened. So these are tough though. Yeah, but I think this. Uh, I think this is enough in your real house. Like I think. Yeah, like I'm not totally clueless. I'm not just straight up guessing. That's what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, I had it you, down between um, A and C, so. You undersold yourself. You, you, you're doing okay so far. Um, yeah. Only a one. Year. Okay, the, the <laughs> next question. Are you ready for the next question? The next one yeah, is yeah. about schools. 
Mm. So um, this one I'm going to have to because the question is which of the – so I'll just say the question before I get into the background. Which of the following okay. statements about this law is most accurate as a matter of constitutional law? Okay. In common so, right uh, now. So. So, so there's like four options. I'll read those after I read the, the first paragraph. So to keep its public school expenditures under control in a time of increasing costs, a state passed a law providing that children who have not lived in the state for at least one year – cannot attend public schools in the state. So again, the question is, which of the following statements about this law is most accurate as a matter of constitutional law? Okay. So your options. A, the one-year residence requirement is valid because it does not affect any fundamental right or suspect class. B, state durational residence requirements that are established for publicly funded services are constitutional because they relate to government operations reserved exclusively to the states by the 10th Amendment. C, because publicly funded education is a fundamental constitutional right, a state may not deny it to any class of persons who reside in that state. And then D, state durational residence requirements established for this kind of publicly funded service solely for the purpose of reducing state expenditures violate the the privileges or immunities clause of the 14th Amendment. Oh, shit. Okay. You, I, I can read it all again if you want. Um, no, no. Uh, I don't – I'm afraid – again, I'm afraid to say stuff because it's going to be like the first thing I say is like, actually, that's the answer. But I don't think it's B because I don't think the Tenth Amendment goes like – well, actually, no, I'm not 100% sure. But there's like preemption. So like federal law is like – how do I put it? Like you got you got to follow that first. And then, and then the state laws kind of fill in the gaps. Um, now, a big thing there is the federal government only has specifically enumerated rights. That's the whole point of the Tenth Amendment. Like, like federal government can do what the Constitution says, but if the Constitution is silent on something, then that's a state right. Um, dang. Yeah. This is uh, so. The way that uh, like con law works here is there's like a bunch of different con law classes. Usually at a lot of places, you the first class is like a very generic overview of kind of everything, but ours is like split up. And so one of the classes is a class specifically on the 14th Amendment, and I'm not in that one. So I don't really know enough about due process as it applies to the states. And because of that, I'm going to say that D is the answer. <laughs> well, you guessed right. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Maybe not for the right reason, but you got it. Uh, that may, I mean, it, yep. it does make sense. I wouldn't have said it if it was like, no way. Um, so, yeah, so this is a violation of the 14th Amendment, basically. That's the, the correct answer. Yeah. Uh, okay, so there you go. Constitutional law. Um, okay, we're on a roll. We're on a roll. So, so, yeah, you're two for three. Technically. 50-50 on the first one, and then uh, good since then. Um, okay, so we got some some neighbor stuff, it looks like, uh, for number four. Oh, I like neighbor stuff. Usually torts. Yeah, these are. There's, or property. So there's, there's 21 of these. We're not going to get to all of them, but maybe we can do You're like a part two of this, you know, because <laughs> okay. these are good. You know, I, these might be good. These are supposedly sample of our questions, so they're they're going to be relevant to what I'm having fun also <laughs> to what you're going to need to know. Uh, and maybe people are learning, you know, like uh, don't don't yeah. cross the train track. Um, number four, a man has four Ger- German shepherd dogs that he has trained okay. for guard duty and that he holds for breeding purposes. Mm-hmm. The man has beware of dog signs yep. clearly posted around a fenced in yard where he keeps the dogs. The man's next door neighbor frequently walks past the man's house and knows about the dog's ferocity. Yep. One summer day, the neighbor entered the man's fenced in yard to retrieve a snow shovel that the man had borrowed during the past winter. The neighbor was attacked by one of the dogs and was severely injured. So your question is, in a suit against the man, is the neighbor likely to prevail? You okay. You can read the questions. You can read no. the options whenever you're writing. A, a fun connected thing that this does not apply to exactly, but there's a rule with, like, animals 
that basically it's like the first bite is free. So basically what that means is like if you have a dog and the the first time it like attacks somebody, you get off basically because you can be like, well, how was I supposed to know that like my dog was going to bite somebody? Um, But then after that, you're strictly liable, which means like it doesn't matter. Like, yeah, all all these factors that kind of go before that don't matter anymore. Strictly liable is just like if it happens, you're on the hook. And then you go from there. Um, But because of the like all the beware of dog stuff and the neighbor pass it all the time, I'm pretty sure the neighbor is like required to know that the dogs are capable of that. So I don't know exactly what like the thing after yes or no is going to be, but I'm pretty sure that the neighbor is not going to prevail. Like he he should have. Let me give you the yes or no. Yeah. So, A, no, because the neighbor knew that the man had dangerous dogs in the yard. B, no, because the neighbor was trespassing when he entered the man's property. Mm. C, yes, because the neighbor was an invitee for the purpose of retrieving the shovel. And D, yes, because the man was engaged in an abnormally dangerous activity. Okay. It's, It's not B or D. It doesn't matter if you're trespassing. And it's not D, because I don't think he was engaged in an abnormal, like, Getting a shovel isn't abnormally dangerous. Um, okay. So the whole invitee, there's like three class. Oh, damn. I hope my torts professor doesn't hear this because he's going to be so sad. Um, but there's like three classes of like people or like three classes of like reasons why people can be on your property. It's like licensee, invitee, and then I forget the word, but like business. So it's not business. And then licensee is actually when like someone's coming over as like a guest and okay i'm not i'm not sure he was an invitee even um okay but if he was an invitee then then it is the dog owner's responsibility to like control his dogs if the guy has a reason to be on there. Oh, so maybe the trespassing thing does come into play. Damn, this is getting pretty technical. All right. For the sake of time, I I'm just going to. I think gonna... that's the, the whole purpose. I know. <laughs> And also, I wish I could, like, go back and, like, open up my torts notes and, like, but that's not good podcasting. So, yeah, for the sake of time, I'm going to go with A, yeah, but I don't feel great about it. You're going with A? I could, it, you, the way you answered that was A. Yeah, yeah. Well, A is no because the guy should have known that the dogs might attack him, right? Yeah, that's what that is. But he did have a reason to be on the property. Yeah, I'm still going to go with A. All right, A is the correct answer. Let's go. You started there, and you circled around to all the other answers, but you should have stuck <laughs> with it from the beginning. Um, yeah, I guess you got you got to know when the dogs are dangerous. Um, yeah, so I wish I actually could have a chance to look up the three classifications of whatever thing. Although what's interesting is a lot of states have moved away from that, so they don't really care why you're on the property anymore. Um, but... It sounds like he did kind of invite himself. So, anyway. All right. Uh, maybe we'll do one more. We'll get five questions. I feel like yeah, that's, yeah, good. that's, that's good. like the whole that's the whole first page of this. So I'm already over fifty percent, so I'm chilling. And number <laughs> six is super long, so that's why we're stopping. that's mm. why we're stopping here. Um, yeah. So you're you're three for four, um, but it's it's a soft three for four. I would call it. You know. Okay. <laughs> what does that mean? You know, it's a non-confident three for four. You know? Yeah, yeah. No, but like you, know, you, you faked your way to three. You faked your way to it, but you, know, you worked it. Um, number five. All right. A woman from state A mm-hmm. filed an action against a retailer in a state court in state B. Oh, this is going to be surf pro. Fuck yeah. The complaint alleged... Or, yeah, the complaint alleged that the retailer had not delivered a hundred thousand dollars worth of goods for which the woman had paid over seventy-five thousand dollars, which is the no, requirement. 100, okay. Yeah, yeah, but the requirement 
for uh like if two places are out of state if like two parties are in different states then in order for it to go to federal court the amount in question needs to be over seventy five thousand dollars which it is so just con- sorry just had to throw that in there right then continue yeah 20 days after being served the retailer which is incorporated in state c mm-hmm. so again the woman's from state a the retailer Yep. Against a retailer in state court, state court and state B. Now the 20 days later, uh, the retailer, which is incorporated in state C and has pr- its principal place of business in state B, filed a okay. notion or filed a notice of removal in a federal district court in state B. Was the action properly removed? Oh, okay. So also the 20 days is relevant because I'm pretty sure you have to do that within three weeks. <laughs> so <laughs> these are nice numbers. Um, okay. So wait. If they remove it, that means they're moving the jurisdiction. But, oh, shoot. This is brutal because I know that if I went in my notes, I could just, like, get the answer straight up. But, so, oh, no, wait, 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 wait. So so the lady in State A is suing the company, right? So a woman from State A is filing an action against a retailer in a state court in State B. Oh, the retailer in state, court is in state B, and they're trying to remove it to federal. The, oh. the retailer incorporated in state C has its principal piece of business in state B, filed a notice of removal in a federal district court in state B. Okay, great. So, so okay, uh, I missed out the first go around, but just to clarify what I was talking about before. I'm still lost, but go ahead, yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, so, so no, I'd love this. Like I said, the civil procedure, that's been my best class in law school so far, so... It helps a lot to have the federal rules of civil procedure pulled up so that I get to like actually look up stuff and reference it. But so, so here's what's going on, right? So, um, kind of like we were talking about with the 10th Amendment thing, right? There's like state courts and there's federal courts. And so, like, yeah, basically they're just, they're just different things going on. Like sometimes you can only sue in federal court if it's like, you know, a federal statute that's being violated or something like that. But a lot of times for like torts and claims like this, it's, it, it's settled in state court. If instead of like state A, B, C, all that nonsense, if everything was state A, they would not even be allowed to try to hear it in federal court. They would have to hear it in the state court of state A because it's contained within the state. So there's no reason to get like the federal government involved is basically the idea. So removing what that term means is basically like it's something's in state court. But one of the parties says, I would like it to be in federal court instead. And the reason why is because that's a little nuanced, but like sometimes the rules are a little different or like the way they get juries is different or even like the judges. It's a little bit of like gaming the system in some ways, kind of technically it shouldn't matter because a court should just like find one way or the other. But the real reason they do it is to like prevent bias. So, you know, if like a one state might be like trying to subconsciously like protect their interests in their state and so they're more likely to rule against so anyway you you take it to federal court so there's no state bias okay so the amount in controversy is satisfied that's the first thing i said has to be over seventy five thousand dollars which it is the second thing is i believe you have to make that notice within three weeks so they said 20 days so i'm not seeing a reason why they couldn't at least ask for it to be removed there might be something about like if the plaintiff or defendant can ask for it to be removed. But I think because the defendant's the one being sued, they're the ones who typically get to initiate that process. Oh, that's the only way it makes sense. Because if the plaintiff wanted it in federal court, they could have just brought the action in federal court. So I'm not seeing a reason why it couldn't be removed. All right, so let me read you the options. Mm-hmm. So again, was the action properly removed? A. No, because the notice of removal was not timely filed. B, no, because the retailer is a citizen of state B. C, yes, because the parties are citizens of different states and more than $75,000 is in controversy. Mm -hmm. D, yes, because the retailer is a citizen of both state B and state C. The fact that it's two states shouldn't matter because the, I believe if I remember correctly, when it, like, the, the 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 thing actually takes place in state A because that's where her stuff didn't get delivered. So I'm pretty sure it's C. I, be, I think it's timely. I think it's 
three weeks, so the 20 days is good. So the correct answer is B, no, because the retailer is a citizen of state B. Really? What? Yeah. I I don't know. How am I? I was just reading the answer. (laughs) I wasn't really asking you. Wait, huh? Oh, man. Now I hope that my CivPro professor doesn't hear this. (laughs) (laughs) Wow, wait. Okay, so... So let me reread the question, okay, because it gets yeah. a little confusing about who's where and who's doing what. So the woman is from State A, filing an action against a retailer in a state court in State B. Okay, it's over $100,000 worth of goods, 20 days after being served. The retailer is incorporated in State C and has its principal place of business in State B, filing a notice of removal in a federal district court in State B. And so the answer is no, the action was not properly removed because the retailer is a citizen in state B. I didn't know that you could do that. So, uh, so <clears throat> I do know that corporations have two citizenships, quote unquote. One is where they're incorporated and one is where their principal place of business is. So, I mean, yes, I did know that the corporation was a citizen of state B, but I didn't know that prevents them from removing it to a federal court. Because the whole point of federal court is that, like, it doesn't matter what, like, citizens people are states of, I thought. So, uh, I'm surprised. Yeah, I guess, I guess you gotta go through the state court first and then you can go to the federal? I don't know. Oh, no, no, no. Like, when, so if you, like, start a trial in state court and then it, like gets appealed or something you stay in the state court system the only way it like jumps is if the state supreme court or the highest court in the state uh gives a ruling and it's a constitutional question and it gets like granted for cert to the supreme court Uh, i guess you know technically supreme court's federal but you know if if something starts in a district in a federal district court then it moves up to the appeal circuit for federal, so it stays, you know, within its lanes. Huh. Well, there you go. Three for five. Uh, not terrible. Oof. Um, definitely some tricky ones there, but uh, you know, you're you're still beginning. You're still you're still learning. So it's not. Yeah, but oh man, I'm not gonna. What a sour note to end on. That. The I'll, I'll, one save, this, wanted so I'll save this file so we can go back to it. Um, you know, again, we got plenty more questions here. There's 20. What did I say? There's 21. Yeah. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll see as you keep taking more classes and uh, learning about different types of law, whether uh, whether you can answer the other ones. So, all right. Any, anything else you wanted to discuss on the show or? <laughs> no, I mean that was fun. Yeah, we hope the listeners learn something. <coughs> you know, maybe nothing, but uh, yeah. To be fair, there's a lot going on without having like a kind of foundation or base to like orient oneself. But uh, I mean, and I don't think like removal is going to be a pretty, you know, pressing topic for <laughs> an everyday person. Um, yeah. But hey. let's let's start. Let's end with an easy, like, quick hitting one here. Um, oh no! Uh, yeah, you can get this one. What B word signifies a legislative body that has two bodies or chambers? <laughs> Bicameral. There you go. <laughs> Whoa! Yes, let's go. <laughs> That's some like fourth grade. <laughs> you know, Government. This other, like yeah. easy. This isn't the easier question mark. I think the hard, they're harder as they go on. Maybe, maybe <laughs> yeah. Um. Okay. So, yeah. There we go. That's, uh, that's it. I, I will let our listeners know. Uh, Anchor got bought by Spotify. I think like a year ago, whenever it was, and we've basically had the same, um, sort of system. Like it's been the same setup. You've noticed there's a new link, but the old link will always redirect to the old one, so it's not a big deal, and you should still be able to find out where you can find podcasts. We did, they, they did change the requirements for ads, 
So unfortunately, I know it's a shock, but our podcast doesn't have enough listeners to meet those minimum qualifications for ads now. Oh we my used gosh, to. Spotify. We used to, but now we don't. So um yeah, I mean, I'm just going to say keep listening, but, uh, you know, tell your friends, I guess. I mean, we're, we're kind of close to the line, but uh, we are going to need a bigger push. So this uh, summer, yeah, let's, when I have some time, I'll look into seeing if we can sue Spotify for you. We, yep, we're going to look into suing Spotify, um, whether it's state court or federal court. We'll, <laughs> we'll figure that out later. Um, but, uh Yeah. Thanks for listening. Nathaniel, thanks for coming on. We'll, we'll test your knowledge in the future. Absolutely. Great time.